Good morning, IBC family. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. I know, I know, I know. We just worshiped last Thursday evening together and then again the next day. But uh, I'm just so happy that we get to worship together right now. So let me just start us up with some prayer and then we continue some worship. Lord, thank you so much for being such a, uh, such a great and awesome God. Lord, what better timing to sing my heart chooses to say, Lord, blessed be your name in a year like this. When we reflect upon 2020, when we're thinking about what went wrong in 2020, Lord, you give and you take away, and my heart is choosing to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Lord, we proclaim this to be true in every heart of every single person that is watching this right now. We proclaim this true in every household, in every fiber, in every square inch of the house, we declare this true for the, for the parents, for the great parents, for the children and the grandchildren, for our siblings and our friends, for everybody that is here, part, that is calling themselves part of the IBC family and beyond. Because, Lord, you are so magnificent and so great. You deserve all glory. You deserve all worship and praise at any given time, not when things are convenient for us, not when things are going well for us, but at any, any given time. Thank you so much for your salvation and for your grace that we can come clean before you, Lord, that we don't have to think, oh, wow, um, we are not worthy because we are not worthy, but we can think we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And Lord, help us to take that not for granted, but to use that to worship you every single day in Jesus' name. Amen. Your glory is so beautiful. I fall onto my knees in awe. In the heartbeat of my life is to worship in your life. Your glory is so beautiful. Your glory.
I stand upon the solid rock of faith in Christ. This steadfast hope shall not break apart within the drought. I am assured His promises will never fail. As long as life remains, He is faithful. God is patient. God is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. His ways are higher than my own. His thoughts consume the great unknown. Of this alone I am sure. My God is love. I draw my breath under His created windswept sky. I know my hope shall last long after my flesh retires from dust. The dawn he calls his children home. His righteousness outlasts generations. God is patient, God is kind. He does not envy, he does not boast. His ways are higher than my own, his thoughts consume the great unknown. Of this alone I am sure My God is IBC family. I hope and trust that you've had a wonderful Christmas with your family. Uh, if you didn't get to join us for the Christmas Eve service, uh, it was totally worth going back and watching it online. Uh, we had such a great time. A big thanks to Pastor Michelle for putting that together for us, and also just a big thanks to everybody who was able to participate with that. It was so cool to see the IBC family come together like that and, uh, and just put that on, be able to worship where we were, and uh, just really, really enjoyed that. And so if you uh, have not had the opportunity to watch that, please go back and watch it. It, it really will bless you, bless us. Uh, you know, as I prepared for this, uh, this sermon, I was trying to find a joke about hindsight being 2020, and uh, obviously I think the context and the way, what it's lent itself to, I couldn't find a funny joke about 2020, and it'd be funny. It really wasn't all that funny uh, as we've gone through, and, uh, and so, uh, uh, but I've, I found it interesting in my preparation that a year ago today, the last Sunday, December 2019, 
we had just come off Christmas season, great celebration then as well, and Pastor Tom gave his final sermon. Final sermon of the year, and it was entitled, Kingdom Messengers. In his conclusion, Tom gave, uh, uh, gave these points. He said, even as Jesus commissioned the twelve, he has also commissioned us. God has prepared us for works to do in advance, and he has given us everything we need to fulfill the task. You know, what a timely sermon for what the year 2020 would bring, to remind it of who we are, light in the darkness, hope in a hopeless world, ambassadors for Christ, comfort in times of fear and suffering, heralds of the gospel. The year 2020 would bring hardship and suffering, And yet, let me say this, Christian, brother and sister in Christ, these are the times that we were made for. You look at history and look at how the church has grown in the history of of time 2,000 years ago, and we see that in the darkest of times, the light of Jesus shines the brightest. It's in the darkest of times that the message of the gospel goes out. And through kingdom messengers such as yourself— God continues to redeem despite calamity. You know, it's often during this time of year that we are ready to hit the reset button. The year is finished. What are my goals for the new year? What can I start fresh on? But it's also important for us to look back and reflect. As I've thought about it and I've asked myself, when we were stuck at home, did I take advantage of the added time I had with my family? Did my kids benefit more? Did I take uh, advantage of the time, and did my wife benefit more from having me at home? When all the distractions or the things that I was busy with in my life were taken away, did I take more time to pray, to read scripture, to reach out to my neighbor? How did we do? How did you do? What did you learn? Specifically, I want to ask the question this morning, as Christ followers, how did you respond to the events that have transpired? Did you respond as kingdom messengers, or were other messages distracting you and your thoughts and your actions? Our main text this morning comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul has come to the end of his life, and he is in jail, and he is writing to Timothy one last time. He spends the first three chapters telling Timothy that he would face suffering for the sake of the gospel, but not to lose heart, but to endure and to conduct himself in a way that is pleasing to God and is in line with who he is in Christ. You know, chapter three of 2 Timothy has much to say about there being difficult times ahead for Timothy, much because of false teaching leading believers astray and because of the fallen nature of mankind. And like Timothy, there has been and there will be difficult times for us all. But Paul encourages him and us in chapter 3, verse 14, by saying this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then Paul gives us this amazing truth. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul is telling Timothy, in times of suffering, in times of persecution, stay the path. Hold firmly to what has been given to you. Scripture, the revelation of Christ. And it will give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Jesus. And that brings us to our text this morning, this charge that Paul gives to Timothy. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1, says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, 
and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. After laying out the context of what Timothy was going to face, Paul gives Timothy his mission. This is going to be what you need to focus on, Timothy. This is going to be what's of most importance. Preach the word. Timothy, you are going to suffer. You are going to face persecution. There are hard times ahead. This is how you are to respond. Preach the word. You know, the word translated preach in the Greek means to proclaim publicly. This isn't something to keep to oneself. The scriptures have given you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And this is what you and any other person needs in any time in their life, not just the hard times. Preach the word and be ready in season and out of season. What, what, what does it mean to be ready to preach the word? To be ready implies that there has been preparation. To ready oneself is to equip oneself. It is to be fully prepared. It's being proactive and not reactive. So how do we ready ourselves to preach the word? Well, it requires our own continual study, our own continual meditation of scriptures, as well as our daily application of its teachings in our lives. Without this, how could you, how could I possibly be able to offer any spiritual insight to a person in crisis or even to a person who just is open to hear the truth about God if we are not ready? You know, a couple years ago, I'm sure many of you will remember, we had the, the power outage across the peninsula. And uh, at that time, my, uh, my in-laws, my wife's parents were staying with us and uh, when the power outage hit, and when we realized it was going to last longer than we anticipated, that's really when the reality of our unpreparedness set in. We had not been to the grocery store. We had, uh, we had nothing stocked in the house. In fact, uh, stores were still open for a little while, but only taking cash. We weren't prepared there either. We hadn't have a way to even cook the food if we had had any food. No way of heating the house. We were not ready to take care of our guests, let alone of ourselves. I think we actually ended up traveling out of town for a couple days. We could even look back at this March. Many of us, myself included, were not prepared for the toilet paper shortage. I'm sure there will be many grandkids one day asking their parents why grandma and grandpa keep so much toilet paper in the pantry. We're to be ready. But Paul says, preach the word, be ready with it, in season and out of season. So what does it mean to preach the word in season and out of season? Some translations say when it's favorable or not favorable. Another translation says uh, when it's convenient or not convenient. I believe the idea here is that whether people are responding positively or not, preach the word. Or even when it's not convenient. You know, it's, it's pretty convenient to preach the word in a church setting. It's pretty convenient to preach the word in a life group setting. It's pretty convenient to preach the word in any program that finds its setting in among Christians, believers in the church. But what about outside of those times? What about the time spent talking with a neighbor or the small talk in the grocery checkout lane? Could it be that we are to speak the gospel, seasoned words, even then? Preach the word in season and out of season. 
we are to be ready with the gospel, to be available so that in times of need, you can respond, whether to be share Christ with someone who does not know him, or maybe it's to come to the aid of a struggling brother and sister in Christ. We are to be ready. Verse goes on, be ready in and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. We're to help correct our brothers and sisters when they stray by reprove, rebuke, and exhorting one another. Exhorting is pretty simple. You just say, hey, this is what the word says, let's do it. You know, and I think we tend to be pretty good at the reprove, rebuke, and exhorting one another. Maybe a little quick at times. And without spending too much time here, I, I do think this is important to say. We need to evaluate our hearts before acting on such an endeavor. Is your motive for restoration or condemnation? Are you acting in love? Are you guilty of similar sin in your own life that you need to deal with? But really, as I think through this verse, it's actually the second part of the verse that catches us off guard, at least for me. It says, we need to do so with complete patience and teaching. You know, this talks of our attitude. It's easy to lose patience. And unfortunately, if you lose patience and you become demeaning, or the person who you are speaking to loses that belief that their brother or sister is approaching them out of love, you lose your voice. A good teacher will revisit a lesson with patience so that the student can continue to grow. Even in my own life, as I have corrected my children, I can see a, a quite a different response in how they respond depending on how I correct. If I have lost my patience, the correction does not come off as something seasons with love, but rather something that's hurtful. So let us be patient. Paul continues here in verse 3. It says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. But as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, Fulfill your ministry. Not everyone will accept sound teaching and will follow what they, they, and they will follow what they want to hear. You know, it's so easy to hear this verse and immediately accuse others. But before we talk about other people committing this, we have to ask ourselves, do we only accept teaching that we want to hear? Do we try to fit God into what we believe he should be like? Do we try to make scripture say what we already believe? Or do we start with God and we start with his word and with scripture and let those things inform our beliefs? Yes, even when they differ. Paul says that there will be and are those who will turn away from sound doctrine and to turn to teaching that they want to hear instead. And certainly this is true for us today as well. So Timothy, how are you to respond? How are we to respond? Paul gives us three things. Be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist. Always be sober-minded. You know, this isn't talking about your alcohol consumption. But it is talking about having a clear mind. Commentator Linsky says, Being sober-minded denotes the clarity of mind and of sound judgment that is not blinded and carried away by follies, fables, and morbid opinions. It denotes a clear eye, a balanced judgment. What a reflection question to ask ourselves this year. Have we been sober-minded in our response to what 2020 has thrown at us? 
Or have our minds been carried away by the virus, by the politics, by our rights, by others' opinions? You fill in the blank. Have we responded sober-mindedly? Second thing he says here, he says to endure suffering. But, but why endure suffering? 2 Timothy 2.10, Paul says this, This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. You do not endure suffering just to endure suffering, but for the people who can call themselves children of God and for those who have yet to follow Jesus with their lives. We endure for the sake of the gospel. And with that in mind, Paul says this, do the work of an evangelist. You know, this isn't a special title one needs or a position to hold. The one must, that one must do to, have, to do the work of the evangelist. Rather, we have all been given this task. Anyone who has the truth of the gospel has the mission to then share it with others. No one can say this is just for pastors, missionaries, professional evangelists. No, this is the work of every believer. And then Paul says, fulfill your ministry. So no matter what happens, Timothy, whoever you encounter, whatever hardships or persecution you endure, continue your ministry. Continue your service unto others. Not getting sidetracked or stopped in your tracks, but endure with sound judgment, preaching the word. Church, we have the same charge. Whatever happens, Whatever hardships we endure, whatever persecution comes our way, whatever political nonsense, whatever health epidemic, whatever comes our way, fulfill your ministry, being sober-minded, endure the suffering, heralding the gospel, and fulfilling our ministry. Paul now reflects on his ministry in verse 6. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Looking back on his life, Paul says he's fought the good fight. You can look at Paul's life, and it can be described as a life of hardship, of struggle. Back in 2 Corinthians 11, starting verse 24, it says this, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship. Through many a sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul's life could be described as a fight. But yet his fight was clear. Paul fought to get the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. And to protect this message so that no one would be led astray by false teaching or ideologies. His utmost concern was that people would know Christ and that they would be counted as children of God. We have to ask ourselves, what is the fight? Without a proper understanding of what the fight is, we may be fighting, fighting battles that in the end have no relevancy to what our mission is. And they only serve as a distraction. You know, I've heard a lot of passionate voices this year, especially as it relates to politics, social justice, our rights, the virus. Lots and lots of passionate voices. But being passionate does not mean that we are passionate about the right things. 
you look up the stats on Clallam County, 29.6% are classified as religious. 29.6%. That doesn't even mean Christian. That, mean, that means we know that at least 7 out of 10 people in Clallam County do not know Christ. They don't follow him, and they are destined to spend an eternity without him. And we have all these other tertiary issues. That is, issues such as politics, rights, or whatever society gets worked up next. But none of these things will change their relationship with God. But the gospel will. I love the passion, but let's redirect it to the real battle. Ephesians 6 Verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is a battle for people's souls. Let us not get distracted. Paul goes on to say then that he had finished the race. fought the good fight, finished the race. You know, this isn't the first time imagery of a race is used to describe our lives following Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, it brings us this illustration of focusing on what is most important. How do you finish the race? Well, you focus on the finish. You do everything you can to get to the finish line. And I love what we are told here. How do we run this race? How are we going to finish this race? By looking to Jesus. With our eyes Focused on him, all other things will serve as a distraction. But with our eyes focused on him, they will all go by the wayside. With our eyes on Jesus, we can endure and we can finish. Our race is still before us. So let us keep and focus on Christ, not getting distracted by anything else. Then Paul says that he has kept the faith. Paul was entrusted with the gospel message and he protected it. Because without the true message of the gospel of Jesus, there is no hope in this world. Nothing, no politics, no money, no person has the ability to save one's soul. We too have been entrusted with this message and we too should guard it from false teaching and other false gospels. So Paul fought the good fight, finished the race, he kept the faith. I have to still ask myself, why did Paul endure? Why did Paul continue to endure? Was he just the kind of person who was just up for a good challenge? Did he like the fight? Did he want boasting rights in heaven in the end? You've got other apostles who are saying, yeah, we live with Jesus. Paul's got to come up with something in his arsenal to one-up them. No, I don't think that was the reason at all. But these are the reasons that I could think of. First, Paul endured to the end because he was loved by God. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 and 16 say, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, And therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Paul was compelled by Christ's love for him. Secondly, Paul endured because he was called by God. If you were to read Galatians 1 and 2, Paul speaks about his his call from God. And what is so amazing is that Paul doesn't ever to seem, he just doesn't ever seem to question his calling. 
when times get hard and they get difficult, he never questions, well, maybe God didn't call him to do this. And I find it interesting that our response is usually the opposite. When times get tough for us, when things get hard, especially when it relates to ministry, one of the biggest questions I hear is, well, maybe God doesn't, maybe this isn't the calling on my life. There must be another calling. This must not be for me. But for Paul, no matter what happened, he stuck to his calling. You may not be called to the pastorate or some other formal position in ministry, but you are called by God to be a witness for him. He was called by God, so he endured. Another reason he endured was for the sake of God's church. We've already read this verse, but just again, 2 Timothy 2.10, This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. He endured for the sake of the church. And he also endured because of the realities of who he is in Christ. Which brings us to verse 8. It says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. There's a crown of righteousness given at the end. But this isn't something that you have earned. Paul is not giving you the formula for salvation or the formula to earn a crown at the end of your life. He's not saying if you endure, this is what you win. Rather, he's giving you the current reality. This is what is waiting for all believers. And I have to tell you guys, this gives me the fuel to keep going. My future is already secured in Christ. Nothing that happens here is changing that. I am a child of God, and because I don't have to earn the right to be a child of God, I get to spend more time living out what a child of God is. I get to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I get to herald the good news, and I get to see that transform other people's lives. I don't need to spend my time looking for meaning or for value, and I don't have to get wrapped around the axle about the things that are only affecting this life because I can now focus on the things that are of most importance, things that are eternal. I want to ask three questions for you guys to consider. Looking back at 2020, how did you respond to all that the year brought your way? I don't ask this question with any condemnation at all. I, too, have taken time to think through how I responded this year. Did I get so wrapped up in all that happened that I missed the opportunity for ministry? I have to tell you, this is one of those moments in history where people are grappling with life's biggest questions. What is the value of human life? What happens if I die? What purpose is there in suffering? But again, this is our time. Believers in Christ preach the gospel in season and out of season. So how did we respond? The second question I have is, have you accurately defined what your fight is? Even if we were to get everything we wanted in this country. Our candidate won the election. We dealt with COVID the way we felt like it should have been dealt with, etc. We could still be missing the bigger picture. The fight for people's souls. We too often are convinced that it is our freedom in this country and our rights that allow the church to grow. Now hear me, we value the religious freedom we have. And as Americans, we've been given the freedom to vote and to influence our country and how it is run. And it is good for us to be involved politically, to vote, to make our voices heard and influence our country for the good. But our freedoms or lack thereof will never dictate the existence 
or growth of God's kingdom. Today, in the most oppressive countries in the world, is where God is growing his churches the quickest. Let us accurately define what our fight really is. The third question I have is, how can we encourage one another in this time? And when other hard times come in the future, how can we encourage brothers and sisters to endure, to keep that which is most important in front of them? You know, I have found it very easy to get distracted in my own life. But I've always appreciated the wise people in my life who have spoken into me to remind me what is truly important. They help me stay out of the weeds and get my eyes back on Christ. You know, I spend time looking at the mud pit and it doesn't do anything for me but bring disgust. And then I get caught up and I begin wading through it and soon you can't distinguish the mud pit from myself. But those people who redirect my vision to Christ, those are examples for us all. Because when they redirect, redirect my vision to Christ, It takes me out of the mire, my focus on Christ. I get to point other people to Christ and see their lives taken out of the pit and out of the mire as well. Encourage one another to focus on what truly matters in this world. Encourage one another to be passionate about what God wants us to be passionate about. Encourage one another to run the race with endurance, with their eyes on Jesus. I want to end with Psalm 16, verse 5. David says, Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. Jesus is our prize. The world has nothing to offer us. So let us truly focus on the true prize and let's direct people there as well. Pray with me, IBC family. Lord, we give you thanks for who you are. Because, Lord, you are sovereign. 2020 didn't catch you by surprise. It won't, 2021 won't catch you by surprise either. And, Lord, we know that you have all things in control. Lord, I pray that we as a body of believers here at IBC, Lord, as we reflect on the year 2020, Lord, I pray that you use this time as a a time of refinement in our own lives, a time of encouragement. And Lord, if we were distracted, if we were caught off guard, Lord, I ask for forgiveness. But Lord, I also ask just for conviction of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to get us back on the right track. Lord, to be passionate for the lost here in our own county. And Lord, not to get caught up, Lord, but Lord, to keep our eyes on you. Lord, I give you thanks that we can do that, that you invite us to do that. That no matter what hard times, whatever suffering, Lord, that we can keep our eyes on you, Lord, and you will give us what we need to endure. You've given us your word, your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I also just give you thanks because I know that all of this is not for nothing. Lord, you are redeeming mankind. So Lord, we do look forward to what you are going to do in our lives, through our lives, and what you're going to continue to do here in 2021. Lord, I ask this in your name. Amen. In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise In the 
morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Well, obviously, family, right now we are going to go into a time of communion, and really, uh, as a church body, there's no greater thing we can do to remind ourselves of what Christ has done for us. I love that we are able to do this weekly with each other, and so I hope this hasn't become something monotonous, but has become a sweet time, a, a reminder of what Christ did and, and why. And so you can take some time, you can pause the stream if you don't have your communion elements, and then we will take it together. Scripture says that on the night before he was betrayed, that Jesus took the bread, and when he had given given thanks, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Obviously, family, take and eat. Scripture then says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink. Jesus, we just thank you again. As we're coming off this Christmas season, we celebrate your birth. But Lord, what is your birth without your purpose and your sacrifice for us? Lord, we are humbled and we are grateful. Lord, I I pray as we go into the new year, Lord, that we would go into this year as kingdom messengers 
proclaiming this message, Lord, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family, Lord, to all those that you would have see us fit in speaking with. Lord, I give you thanks for this worship service this morning, being able to worship you. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.